Hello, welcome to the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. I am your host, Roy Kessel, and today we are very excited to have with us Dr. Lindsay Sarah Krasnoff. Lindsay is a historian and consultant and does incredible work around the sports world. So Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we're excited to hear more about what you're working on now, but I kind of want to bring you back to the beginning and talk about how you developed your love and passion for sports. You know, so that's a great question. I am originally from the Boston area. So I grew up as part of Red Sox Nation way before they actually began to win anything. And I grew up going to Boston Bruins games with my, my dad and my grandfather. And I would always ask questions that perhaps should have been somewhat telling at the time. Why do people talk differently than we do? I don't have a typical Boston accent. Um, why are they drinking tall beers out of paper bags? Where are all the women and girls? And so, you know, from an early age, I started to ask these larger questions about kind of more social, cultural, geographic issues um, in and around the arena. Um, and that was really kind of my initial entry point into this interest in sports. I played sports uh, growing up um, and during college, I was not good enough to play a, a varsity level sports, but I did start working as um, a, a reporter for the uh, sports department of my college newspaper, uh, the GW Hatchet. And, you know, that was kind of my first uh, taste of the, the sports media world. And I liked it enough that I decided to go back for a master's in journalism but the idea to pursue a sports journalism uh, track, I did a, a joint program at New York University in journalism and French studies, kind of blending my two areas of interest. And that's what first got me started into the concept of French sports. Um, in order to leave NYU, I had to do a series of investigative articles on something sports and something France. And at the time, it was right after France won the World Cup the first time and the European Championship. And so uh, football, soccer football, was just kind of the natural um, point of entry when trying to think of, well, what the heck am I going to write about, about French sports? At the time, although the, you know certainly we had the internet, it was nowhere near as advanced and pervasive as it is now. And so it was really difficult to get information about how did France train its young um, elite uh, soccer players. How did how did they make Les Bleu, the national team? Um, and so that's really how I got my interest in sports, my interest in French sports, and kind of the starting point of my interest in the field, more from the larger social cultural side, and then later geopolitical. Um, but you know, really more about that rather than only the box score. And that's a great way to talk about it. I loved your comment about where are all the girls and women. Um, it's it's something that you, you think about. We're we're still not there, right? It's something that's still a problem in so many aspects of the sports world and the sports business world and the sports media world. We we look at obviously enormous improvement over the last ten to twenty years compared to what it had been yep. historically. But right, we're still scratching the surface on on where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And so you were certainly a pioneer in, in, in recognizing that at a very early stage in, in your life and, and asking those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very much. And, uh, you know, at the time, sports journalism was still, um, you know, focused more on the day to day coverage and some in in depth behind the scenes pieces. But um, no one was really uh, publishing much of the kinds of stories that I wanted to write. And so that's what helped to propel me to go and pursue my PhD in history. It wasn't the only, um, the only um, reason, but it was part of the decision matrix in that by pursuing a history degree in I studies as a modern Europeanist um, with a specialty on France and then within that subset on French sport, um, it allowed me to kind of um, explore the ways that different social, cultural, uh, geopolitical, economic movements over the longer period of time help to play into and shape and mold what plays out in the sports world, whether it's 
youth training and development programs and national policies for how to support elite athletes, whether it is um, how generations of immigration help to change national demographics and how you see that literally playing out on the sports field with France. It, uh, just like the United States, it's long been a country of immigration. And when you look at who plays on the French national teams over time throughout the 20th and 21st century, those players are very much reflective of the different immigration waves into France. Um, so, uh, you know, the, it all kind of helped to feed um, very holistically um, into each other. And it's interesting how that all pulls together because we talk about sports being a unifying factor, mm -hmm. breaking down barriers and really creating relationships and opportunities that would never have existed outside of the sports realm between the competition and, and the interaction and everything else. So you've done a lot internationally. Um, you look at where sports have gone, where, where women's sports have gone, and, and talk a little bit about what you see on the horizon now. We talked about what some of the problems have been, but we're sitting here in, in 2021, um, still facing some of the problems from a long time ago, but what, what do you think we're going to see over the next three to five years? So the, you know, so much of the conversation over the past year has focused on what is wrong. Um, and ideas for how to push it forward. But I think we're at this really interesting point around the precipice of actually putting some of these things into action. And so in my, in my work, I'm working very much at the intersection of global sport communications and diplomacy. I'm doing a lot on the, it, within the sports diplomacy field, both on the academic as well as on the practitioner side. And as it relates to particularly women in sport and women in sports diplomacy, I think one of the you know, key things that's emerged um, that is going to be a driver um, in the next three to five, 10, 15 years is uh, really focusing on women's leadership in sports and sports diplomacy and how that kind of all fits together um, and how sports diplomacy can be a way to empower women. Um, in various around various different tables in the global sports world. Um, it's really interesting. I was, uh, I um, moderated a, a panel earlier today, uh, kind of delving into this topic. And one of the things that we talked about was, well, what are some ways that this current um, crisis has provided windows of opportunity? Um, and I think really the push for women's sports, women in sports, and also women's leadership in and around those areas, especially through the sports diplomacy uh, matrix, is something that is has legs. It's not going away. It's an ever-increased focus. And so I think that's going to be the main trend, um, providing greater opportunities and exposure for women um, in sports, um, in organizations, especially governance uh, organizations, uh, where it's um, lagging. Um, and, you know, we've started to see the early fruits of some of this work. Uh, the announcement re last week, this past weekend, over the past few days over a new um, media company backed by Alex Morgan um, and Chloe Kim and Sue Bird and someone else who, forgive me, I, I, the name is blanking on me. It's been a long day. Um, but, you know, they're focused on telling women's sports stories and women's stories through sports. Um, in a way that other media outlets have not yet been focusing on in the same way. So we are seeing the early actions of all the conversations, ideations, uh, and planning that's been going on while we've all been stuck at home over the past year. And so I think we're on the precipice. I think it's going to um, really move forward and hopefully gain greater momentum over the next several years um, to bring women more fully concretely, equally um, into the sports field in a variety of different ways. It's interesting because you pointed out lagging behind on governance and on storytelling. And you, you think of storytelling and how many women are involved in telling stories in all kinds of other aspects of the world. It's interesting that that has really lagged behind in, in the sports space. Yeah, when you look at, uh, you know, the sports media, just look at who are the journalists. Um, yes, there are some awesome 
women um, doing pioneering work in the field. But, and I haven't seen the latest figures, but you know, at a good majority are still men of some shape or variety. And so the other area you mentioned was governance. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the lack of, of women involved in that aspect. So tell us about where you think that is going. Like, how have you seen that play out? Oh, well, so one example of where I've seen that play out has been uh, within the world of global basketball. I know that FIBA, the International Basketball Federation, is has been very cognizant of um, uh, women in basketball, not just women's basketball. Um, and so you do see uh, throughout several uh, national federations around the world, women in senior positions within their national basketball federations. Um, sometimes they're former players, sometimes they're coming up on the official side. So that is, you know, a very small snapshot um, that offers hope, but, you know, by and large, uh, there, there's a lot more work to be done. It's not just bringing women into governance, but making sure that they're at the senior level of governance and that they're not a token, right? That they, that they have full voice and uh, parity and weight in, in leadership. Well, that, that's always important to make sure that the voices are heard and that we're not, right. as you said, it's not just a token. It's not somebody being put on a board um, to satisfy a, a diversity box that they can just put a check mark that, right. that they've got that happening. And, and I think what's so interesting when you look at the outstanding leaders around the world of sports that, that are women, um, there's an enormous number of them. And people talk to us all the time about uh, diversity in, in our events and panels and things like that. And I say, I really don't have to try hard to find women. It always amazed me for years when uh, Sports Business Journal or other groups were promoting their conferences and you'd look at the little headshots and there's a page of 60 or 70 people and it's white male, white male, white male. And, and, and out of a big group, you would have a few women you would have very few African-American and, and even fewer of any other uh, uh, race or minority that, that were involved. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is improved, but you still look around and, and I don't understand it because as I interact, maybe it's the sports philanthropy space more so than the sports business world where there, there truly is a huge number of women involved in very senior roles, very successful leadership. And so as you've gone through this, I know you've been around this world for a while. What what are the areas that are your hot buttons and your passion? Uh, so really kind of within this sports diplomacy framework and helping to uh, educate uh, people around, around the table about what sports diplomacy is, which is it, sports diplomacy is a tool um, uh, uh, to bring people together. It's a people to people exchanges, cultural exchange, but it can also be technical exchange. It can be knowledge exchange. And it occurs you know, when there's communication, representation and negotiation uh, in and around the sports field. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people think of sports diplomacy as hosting the Olympics or sending Dennis Rodman to North Korea. Um, which are examples of sports diplomacy, but there, that's more formal sports diplomacy. And there's a lot of different ways that informal sports diplomacy plays out day to day, especially when you're talking about operational um, global leagues. You know, I always point to the NBA as one example. Yes, it's an American league. Yes, it has a global presence, but what makes it a really interesting Kind of incubator of sports diplomacy is one in four NBA players were born and trained overseas. And so you've got to imagine that any kind of team chemistry that they're building to play well together on the court is involving some of these conversations, whether it's over dinner in the locker room or wherever. Hey, you know, what, what's it like back where, where you're from? What's it like back home? What's basketball like? How did you get into it? You know, can you teach me that Euro, Euro stuff? You know, the uh, so, you know, those sorts of informal conversations or when you think about the ways that um, some teams are doing community engagement with their international players, um, because because I'm a, you know, a French specialist, I, I focus on the French players um, in the league and 
I know that many of the teams do community engagement days with the um, you know, local French schools or French teachers and you know, are able to get the American students in meeting with their French players and talking a little bit. Um, so you know, those are examples of informal sports diplomacy and it happens all the time. Key is having some kind of intentionality, but recognizing that it, it is a tool to bring people together, even if you don't always recognize it at the time. I liked your examples where people look at something like the Olympics and think that that's really the the only way to do it. And and again, something that happens every four years. I think the Olympic framework and and vision helps accomplish a lot of sports diplomacy. And if you look mm -hmm. at the regional competitions uh, in all sports, whether it's it's FIFA, whether it's the Olympics, whether it's any of the other um, international competitions, it's great for people to go and see. Uh, another culture. I think as a historian, right, you look back on it, it was a lot different because you didn't get to experience other cultures the way you can now virtually. You can look in and see what's going on in other countries and learn about them and, and get a real visual and interactive experience in a way that you could not have done with French sports back in the 70s, right, if you weren't on the ground. And so I think that sports really served a, an enormous platform for people to have those cultural exchanges and, and interactions. And how do you see that changing now with all of the new technologies? I think what, you know, one thing that's helped to facilitate sports diplomacy is the growth of the internet and especially social media, uh, but also kind of twin to that, the um, growth of business and leisure tourism that, you know, they kind of fuel each other uh, together. Um, it certainly has fueled, uh, say, the way that several countries, uh, such as France, for example, or Rwanda, have made hosting major sporting events part of their official sports diplomacy policy. So bringing people um, to the country to go and watch a game or watch a competition and in the process learns a little something about the country. Um, you know, so that's one of the evolutions and you see a lot more countries over the past 15 years really formalizing hosting of sporting mega events as part of an official sports diplomacy policy. Um, but the other evolution is, as I mentioned, the rise of internet and social media and how it's facilitated communication, representation and negotiation across national uh, geographical borders. And so that has helped to diffuse the concept of who conducts diplomacy, right? You know, the, I always say, you know, it's no longer the, the stereotypical um, diplomats in pinstripe suits, right? That's the old uniform that they all wore. Um, it's now uh, ambassadors in track suits uh, to a certain extent. You think of just over the past year, which American personality has perhaps had a greater impact worldwide about communicating about US culture or issues or ideals. It has not been a main politician. It's been a LeBron James. It has been a Serena or Venus Williams, you know, um, some of these athletes with huge global followings who are increasingly vocal about, you know, speaking up um, for what matters to them, pointing out problems in society when they exist, um, saying, you know, this is what I represent. Um, so those are kind of two of the key, key evolutions that, you know, we see in the field over the past 20 years. And the evolution is happening more quickly all the time when you look yes. at the technology and, and the deployment of everything that goes on. People forget that um, in, in a sense, right, iPhones have only been out about 15 years or not even 15 years. Yeah, and yeah. so it, it it seems that this has been part of our, our culture forever. And, and yet you go back really not that long ago and, and they didn't even exist. And people can't think of, of it without them. Um, you know, I'm an Android guy, so you know, I'm a anti iPhone person, but um, you know, you deal with all of the, uh, the breakdowns and look at the things, but the technologies continue to evolve every year there's new things coming up new social media platforms and it's hard mm -hmm. to be active in all of them it's hard to be engaged and develop 
good strategy across all of those fields. And so how do you decide from, from your end where you want to focus your efforts because you can really spread yourself thin if you start looking across LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. So in terms of where I am, where I am operating, is that? Yeah. And, and in terms of the work that you're doing, like what do you mm. find to be the most useful platforms for the sports diplomacy and for engaging yeah, with the storytelling? People in your... Yeah. No. So that's a really great uh, question and something I struggle with all the time because you have to set certain boundaries or set certain focus areas. And so I, I'm predominantly on Twitter as well as LinkedIn in terms of communicating uh, uh, about sports diplomacy. The, I think Twitter was just kind of the, where I began so many years ago. And that's how I actually got connected with a lot of really interesting scholars around the world who were doing somewhat similar, but yet different enough work um, that, you know, I, my first use of Twitter was really as a networking tool with other historians and sports scholars who were working on international football soccer. Um, and, and increasingly that then branched out into some of the journalists who were covering or working in that field and who were digging, doing the deeper digging for the more interesting stories or wanted to kind of expand their own background knowledge so that they had a better window in when they were reporting uh, or covering the World Cup. Um, similarly with basketball. So basketball and soccer, the two sports that I you know, just focus on the most, um, depending upon uh, you know, wh what I'm working on, it will be more of one than the other. Um, and so that's also why I talk about those two sports primarily, even though you can see right behind me on my mantelpiece, uh, all the uh, old ski boots uh, from, my, from our ski days. Um, but so Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, but I'm, I'm really focused on trying to help to explain and unpack the concept of sports diplomacy so that people have a better recognition of what it is, what it consists of, the possibilities of how they can operate within that framework. There's a lot of interesting work being done over in Europe in and around sports diplomacy, not just in government, not just in academia, but blended um, particularly with industry, with teams, with leagues. And I'm trying to bring more of that uh, to North American audiences. And you know, it starts with the educational aspect. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that and also trying to help uh, different organizations or um, different stakeholders think about how they too can store, tell their story through the sports diplomacy prism whether it's athletes, whether it's a, a nonprofit, whether it's a team. Um, if you're operating internationally with international staff or you know, very engaged in international uh, events and competitions, chances are you've got a sports diplomacy angle. Uh, the key is to recognize it. Storytelling through that prism is very new. So it offers a lot of interesting avenues that you could take it depending upon where your particular focus is. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I'm focused. Well, and it, it looks as if uh, you, you've had great experience. You've really dove in deep to these types of issues and developed that platform as sports diplomacy. Uh, I think what's, what's interesting is, as you said, most people aren't even familiar with that term. They don't understand kind of what's involved. They don't understand that there's a, uh, there's a movement. The US State Department has a sports diplomacy mm -hmm. section and, and focuses on that. And the number of initiatives that would fall under that banner are significant. Um, I think at times in, in the US, we get very American centric, right? Everything focuses mm -hmm. on what goes on here. Maybe we, we, we know a little bit about Canada and, and Mexico, but when you think of the global sports perspective for most of the people that are not actively involved in that, right? Their entire sports mm -hmm. prism revolves around the US. Right, yeah. And so it, it's very much a way to kind of shift and uh, expand um, the, the concept of how, you, how you're engaging and communicating and telling your story. Um, so I, I do a lot of this work um, with my consulting work, I do a lot of it kind of in my scholarly writing. I'm a research associate 
with the international uh, the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, uh, SOAS University of London. Uh, so that is kind of where I've been helping to build out the sports diplomacy field and do a lot of interactive workshops and roundtables on sports diplomacy and different kind of topics of intersection, whether it's women and sports diplomacy, um, refugees and sports diplomacy, um, uh, what was another uh, basketball diplomacy in Africa um, last year uh, through, through my SOAS affiliation. I co-directed a basketball diplomacy in Africa oral history project, which is the first of its kind online oral history archive um, pegged to the NBA's new Basketball Africa League. Uh, but speaking with some of the key uh, movers in um, African basketball from the NBA side, as well as from outside of the NBA um, to really uh, dig in deeply with them about basketball, both kind of its history and evolution from their own experience, but also the ways that basketball serves as a driver of globalization and sports diplomacy, as well as basketball development and basketball for development. So there's kind of an interconnection of all of that there. Um, but I, you know, I also uh, teach on sports diplomacy. I'm uh, teaching a course at uh, NYU, New York University at their Global Sport Institute uh, this semester on sports diplomacy, where we're very much focused on non-US examples, uh, providing more of a global perspective of what other countries are doing or what or other organizations are doing and what it can look like and pulling it all together from there. It's great that you're sharing that landscape and, and I applaud NYU for having that type of uh, vision to include that course and, and give the students that exposure because I think increasingly, especially with the age of social media and all the technology, the international landscape is now more accessible. There, there's ways to engage and interact and teach and train um, in a virtual basis. It's not a, a perfect substitute for being in person and being on the ground, right. but it certainly cuts down some of the barriers and access that exist. It cuts down uh, the the cost structure for organizations overseas, especially in uh, in places like Africa or certain sections of South America, where they they wouldn't be able to have these programs or these training and and work with everything. It would be much much more expensive to have to do mm -hmm. that all on the ground. So. Uh, Lindsay, you're doing amazing work. I, I love hearing all of these stories. Um, I want, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit differently okay. um, to start, but number one is I'm going to make you pick your favorite story from the last year. Oh, and this year in particular, there's been a lot of very interesting stories. Um, I think this, and it, it, it's a story that still hasn't ended yet. Um, I think the way that the WNBA has emerged as really this force in athlete advocacy um, and how they, they, you know, one of the questions is, well, how can you measure success? Well, they have now various different metrics of success. Um, they have uh, started a larger movement um, within the sports labor force. Um, they have helped to um, actually get voters to vote for change um, when they encouraged um, you know, voters to not vote for the Atlanta, then Atlanta Dream owner, uh, S Senator um, Leffler. Um, so I think the, w, the emergence of the WNBA, and with it, you know, keep in mind that um, their, their media uh, spotlight has been increasing significantly over the past year, even though they've been around for 20, 25 years, uh, it's been a significant increase as a result over the past year. And, you know, hopefully that translates into then, you know, trickle down effects um, for the players. They also, this is the first year with their new uh, CBA um, in place. So I think the story of the WNBA as a whole is really out of a year of so many fascinating stories. I think that that as a whole is really fascinating how they have been um, moving towards affecting change and now have some of the results for that. 
Um, I also think of, you know, there's been a change at the top management over uh, with, I think it's the Dallas team, um, very much working um, from within. And so I think it's really interesting in the WNBA, especially because so many players and coaches have also played overseas in addition to also having overseas players in the league in normal years. Um, so I think that's really fascinating in the way that they are helping to spread certain ideas of the possible, uh, not just on the basketball court, uh, but off court as well, uh, not just to other US athletes, but to other global athletes. I think that's really, really interesting. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of connected to that uh, is the, you know, the pro-democracy movement in Belarus uh, right now. It's been ongoing since August and a lot of the Belarusian athletes have been at the forefront protesting uh, against the allegedly corrupt uh, uh, elect presidential elections there. So protesting for democracy, for civil and human rights. And some of the athletes at the forefront have been female athletes, including former WNBA players. So I think that for me is perhaps the most interesting story, the, the larger WNBA story. And it certainly was was a big story in the way that they stepped up and took the lead on, on some of those issues. And um, it, it's interesting because, you know, you, you look at the the comment that came out um, about athletes shouldn't be uh, getting involved in, in political issues or in social types of issues. And LeBron came right back and said, yes, absolutely, we should, and, and we're going to be. And mm -hmm. it was nice to see that leadership from, from his end. So Lindsay, tell people how they can reach you if, if they want to connect and engage or, or help find ways to support the work that you're doing. Sure, you can always find me on Twitter. My handle is Lempika7. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can also find me on my website, lindsaysarahkrasnoff.com. Um, that has a lot of different tools and assets on it. So before we let you go, I wanna put you on the spot one more time. And now we're going to use our sports philanthropy superpowers and, and wave our magic wand. We're going to ask you uh, if we could appoint you as commissioner of one sport, what sport would you choose? Oh, that's a really good, that's a tough question. I would want to be commissioner of the International Federation of Skiing, specifically the Alpine division, mostly so that I can spend an entire season following their World Cup circuit around from one uh, ski resort to another. There's a lot more obviously that goes into it, but you know, that's an example of a very international global sport, albeit you know, rather small and uh, privileged in certain ways. And there's certainly a, a few issues on that side, but I, I think it would be super fun to you know, globe trot from one ski resort to the other. And that's just speaking to my own um, interest, uh, but yeah. So now that you're in charge of, of that, what's the first change that you're going to make, either competitive rule or, or something in the policies that exist there that you'd like to see different? And uh, create greater opportunities for, for girls and women to access snow sports at large, uh, specifically alpine skiing, um, where costs can be prohibitive. Uh, ski equipment is not cheap. Getting, getting to ski resorts is not cheap. Um, being able to train uh, as well, so trying to trying to create the opportunity and access, um, which oftentimes is just one of the first ma of many major roadblocks. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. It was great to hear about all your work in the, the sports diplomacy uh, arena, incredible things to bring people together through sports and make those connections. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. Great, thanks so much for having me, it's a pleasure. And for all of our listeners and viewers, we appreciate you taking the time to join us on the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. This is your host, Roy Kessel, signing off. Please remember to live generously.